What is going on guys? Welcome back to the third part of the R tutorial series on Neural9. In this video today, we're going to learn about data structures. So let us get right into it. All right, so we talked about data types in the last video. Today, we're going to talk about data structures. So structures that allow us to hold multiple values in a single variable. Now, to be precise, we're going to cover the following data structures in this video today, vectors, lists, matrices, arrays, and factors. And in the next video, we're going to cover data frames. So in the fourth episode, we're going to cover data frames. The basic intuition behind them or the TLDR in a nutshell explanation is vectors are collections of multiple values that have the same data type. Lists are collections of values that can have different data types. Um, matrices are two dimensional collections of different values that can also have different data types, arrays are higher dimensional than that, and factors are categorical collections. And data frames can be compared maybe to Excel tables, we're going to talk about them in the next video. But these are the ones that we're going to cover today. So how can we combine multiple values into a single variable? Let's say for example, I want to have a collection or a variable numbers here, and I want to assign to this variable multiple values, for example, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Uh, how I can do that in R is by using the combine function. And the combine function is just the C function. So C and parentheses around the values. And when I run this line of code here, you can see it creates a list or to be precise, a vector, a numerical vector of numbers here, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, and this object now contains all these values. So if I try to print it, you can see it prints all the values. Now it's also possible to access individual values. For example, maybe I just want to have the first value of that list. And in this case, I can use square brackets to index the first um, value. So to get the first position, and I do that by saying numbers, square brackets, and in the square brackets, I use the index, which is one in this case. So numbers one will give me 10 because 10 is the first number here. Now, this will sound right for someone who's never programmed before. For those of you who already know Python or C or any other programming language, you might be confused or annoyed by the fact that we start counting with one because in most programming languages, we start counting at zero. In R, we start counting uh, with one. So the first position has the index one, the second one has the position two, uh, or the second position has the index two. So if I say numbers two, I get 20. If I say numbers three, I get uh, 30. And I can also provide slices. So let's say I want to have the values from the second position up until the fourth position, what I can do then is I can say two colon four, and this will give me the values 20, 30, 40. So I specify the range from two to four, I want to have the values two, three, uh, or 20, 30, 40. Um, I can also access individual positions, multiple individual positions by passing another vector. So for example, if I want to have the first position and the fourth position here, what I can do is I can pass a vector again with a combined function and I can pass one and four. In this case, I get 10 and 40 here. Um, I can also do the same thing with negative indices. So I can say negative one and negative four to get all the values except for the first one and the fourth one. So in this case, I would get 20, 30 and 50, as you can see. So these are just different ways in which we can index multiple values or individual values of a vector. Uh, the same thing can be used to now change values. So I can go ahead and say numbers at position one, I want to change that to 100. If I do that, you can see that now I have 100 in here. And I can also do the same thing with slices, I can say one, two, three, should be one, two, three, for example, and now I have one, two, three, 40, 50. So we can also use assignments like this. Now, what else can we do, we can get some basic information about a vector, we can get the length of a vector. Uh, by just using the length function and passing numbers to it. In this case here, I get um, a five as a result, because I have five values. And as I mentioned, by the way, um, we we said in the beginning that vectors can only have a single data type. So for example, I can also have uh, a vector full of character values, so full of text. And in this case, I can do something like hello, world, I love math, for example. And this would work because that's a vector of the type character. 
Now it also works technically if I use mixed types, but you're going to see what happens. Um, because what happens here is the typecasting is being enforced. If I have, for example, 10, 20, 30, and hello, the common data type that's compatible with all these values is the character data type. So what's going to happen automatically is that this is going to be typecast into character values. So it's the string or the character 10, uh, the text 10, the text 20, and the text 30, not the numerical values. Uh, if I use not uh, hello, but for example, if I have 40 L, which is an integer, this integer is being typecast into a numeric value. If I have a Boolean in here, like or a logical in here, like T, it's typecast into a number as well, which is one for true and zero for false. As you can see, so it doesn't really crash the application, it doesn't really crash your script, but it does automatically typecast the values, which is not always desirable. Uh, now let us move on. How can we also create vectors? Uh, we can create vectors easily by saying, for example, numbers is equal to C and then specifying a slice in here. One to 30, for example, would give me the values from one to 30. So if I print or if I output numbers, you can see I have the values from one to 30, which I can initialize like this. Uh, what I can also do is I can use a function called sec for sequence. And I can say I want to start from zero to let's say 500. I want to have all the values with a step size. Um, so by equal to 50, for example, and in this case, if I print numbers, I would get zero 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on up until 500. So this is also an easy way to initialize um, <clears throat> to initialize a vector, we can also repeat vectors. So for example, if I have the vector one, two, three, four, five, I can repeat that vector by calling the repeat function, the rep function. Uh, and I can say, for example, times equals five, what's going to happen here is it's going to just repeat the vector five times in a row, I can also specify instead of times each, so I can say each equals four, uh, each equals five, uh, which gives me the individual elements repeated. So not one, two, three, four, five, five times, but one, five times, two, five times, three, five times, and so on. And I can also do this um, manually, I can say times equals and I can pass a vector here that specifies, for example, uh, like this, this would mean I want to repeat the first element one time, the uh, second element two times and so on. So you can see one, two, two, three, three, uh, so three times three, four times four, and so on. Uh, but of course, I can also do five times one, for example, this also works. Uh, so these are just some small things that you can do here. Also, an interesting thing is there is another operator that we can use now with these data structures, which is the membership operator. So I want to know if a certain value is part of a um, of a variable of a collection. So for example, if I look at numbers, the value 50 is part of that numbers collection. How do I check for that? I can say 50 and then percent in percent numbers, this will give me true because 50 is part of numbers. If I ask the same thing for 55, I get false because 55 is not part of the numbers uh, data structure of the numbers vector. Now, if I want to not change values, but append values. So if I want to add values to the numbers uh, vector here, let me just remove all of this. Uh, what I can do is right now I have just numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I can print that as well to, to see that that's the case. Uh, what I can do now is I can use the append function to append new values to numbers. So I can say numbers and then uh, 60, for example. And then you can see I have, uh, or actually, sorry, I need to assign this. So I need to say numbers is equal to that. Um, but then you can see we have now the 60 in here as well. Um, and we, what we can also do is we can combine multiple vectors into a single vector by using again, the combined function. So if I have vector one, equal to one, two, three, and then I have vector two, equal to four, five, six, what I can do is I can say vector three is equal to C of v one and v two. Uh, actually, I need to run these code lines first, and then v three is as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's also quite simple. So these are the basic operations we can do with vectors. These are uh, the basic things and a list now for a list, we don't need to really understand a lot more than that. The only difference is that a list doesn't do automatic typecasting. So for example, if I have here my vector where I have some hello in here, 
the vector typecasts everything to uh, a character. If I change the C here to be a list instead, so if I use the list function, you can see now I have the uh, list numbers in here and it contains different values. It contains number 10, number 20, character hello, number 40, number 50. And the same thing that we did with the vectors, so the appending and the repeating and the length and the uh, membership and so on can be done with a list. So there's nothing new about this. I can just say hello, for example, in numbers and it works. So the same things that we can do with vectors, we can also do with lists. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention, let's do that quickly, is if I have, for example, uh, a numbers vector or list, doesn't matter if I have, for example, 10, 50, 30, 20, 40, this is unsorted. What I can do is I can call the sort function on numbers, and this is going to sort the values. Um, it's not gonna sort them uh, immediately. We need to assign this again, so we need to say, numbers is equal to the sorted version of numbers, but then the numbers are automatically sorted. And this also works with uh, characters and it also works with lists. So uh, this is just something I forgot to mention. So lists are basically vectors where we can have different data types. That's the TLDR version here. Now for matrices, what we can do or what we have to do is we provide multiple uh, or we have multiple columns and rows. For example, what I can do to define a matrix is I can say number underscore matrix is equal to matrix. This is the function that we use to create a matrix. Uh, and now I can provide uh, a vector full of values. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then I can say I want to have with this data, I want to split it up or I want to um, arrange it into n row equals three into three rows and n column equals four into four columns. And now I can show the number matrix. And you can see now that I have four columns, three rows with the values arranged here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Of course, this also works if we say just one, 12 like this. The important thing is you need to make sure that these are compatible. Since I have 12 elements, I can arrange them in three times four uh, cells. If I have something else like 15, for example, you can see I get uh, that there is a problem. So this doesn't work and it uh, just cuts off everything. Um, what we can also do here is we can change the order. So as you can see now, the values are arranged like this. We have first column, one, two, three, second column, four, five, six. We can also transpose this. We can say by row, um, by row equals true, because by default, it's false. And then we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this is uh, just a different way to arrange the values here. Um, and basically, the idea now is the same as before, just that we have two indices, because now we have row and column. So we still use square brackets to access individual values, number matrix, if I say, for example, one, what I get is I get the first value in general from the list. Uh, if I say two, I get uh, the second value. So in this case, uh, right now it's it's going like this. So if I set this here to false, we will get one, two, three, and so on. But since this is true, it goes basically um, it goes down first. So it goes one, five, nine, two, six, ten, and so on. If you just provide a single number. But we can specify, for example, that I want to have the first row and the second column. And what I get here is I get two because this is the first row and the second column. Uh, I can also provide the second row and the third column, which should be seven. So two, three, seven, as you can see. Um, I can also access the entire row. So if I say two comma nothing, I get the entire second row, five, six, seven, eight. And if I say comma two, I get the entire second column, two, six, 10. So this is what we can also do. And again, we can do the same thing. We can access using um, using vectors. We can access a specific area. So for example, here I can say first and third um, with a comma, first and third row. So don't show me the second row. Or I can say also, uh, first and third row and first and third column. So I get only 
these values here selected. Um, this is just the indexing here. Uh, now I can also do something like appending, but I have to do it row wise or column wise. So what I can do is I can say number matrix um, is equal to R bind to add a new row. I add to the number matrix now new values here 13, 14, 15, for example, uh, not R bind, R bind. Uh, what's the problem here? Not a result. Of... Let me just double check this. Oh, because, yeah, of course, we need to, since we have uh, four columns, we need to add four values. This is important. If you add a new row, you need to add as many um, values as there are columns. If you add a new column, you need to add as many values as there are rows. So since we have four columns, I need to add, um, actually, I need to reset this here. Let me just run this again. There you go. Now we have it correctly. Uh, so this was the matrix before and I had to add four new values for a new row. And I would have now since I have one additional row, I would have to add four new values as well for a column. And I do this with the function C bind for column bind. And in this case, I could go with something like 100, 200, 300, 400. There you go. So this is how you add new columns and new rows to your matrices. Now arrays, the next data structure are basically like matrices, but they can be higher dimensional. So for example, number array is equal to an array. This is the function that we use. And I say, I want to add the values from one to 30, for example, and the dimensions are equal to uh, two times five times three. So two times five is 10 times three is 30. So it's compatible. And this would give me the following array. Now I can also change this because what I have now here is I have two rows with five columns three times. So I have three matrices, you could say, that have two rows and five columns each. Uh, I can also change this, I can say I want to have five matrices with two rows and three columns each. There you go. Now I have five different matrices. Uh, and, and you can go on and on with that. So an array is basically a higher dimensional matrix. That's the in a nutshell uh, version. And I can use the dim function to get the dimensionality. So in this case, I get two, three, five. So what I'm providing here, I can also get from an existing array. If I load it from somewhere, um, I can get it with the dim function here. And finally, the last thing that we're going to talk about today is factors. Factors are basically just collection of values again. But the idea here is that there are categorical values. So a, a very good example for this would be programming languages. Let's say you want to keep track of uh, what programming languages people use. So you have person one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe in a data frame later on, as we're going to see in the next video. Uh, but the idea is now some of them like Python, some of or code in Python, some of them code in C++ and R, whatever. Uh, what you could do here is you could say factor C and then some values like C++ and Java and Python and maybe Python again and maybe C++ again and then maybe Python again, whatever. I can run this now and programming languages is now a factor and what you can see is we have the values but we also have the levels which means the categories. This is just a useful uh, data structure that we're going to see in data frames. As I said, data frames can be uh, thought of as sort of Excel uh, or Excel tables. You have name, age, job, uh, programming language, and programming language could be a categorical feature, a categorical column. So we don't just have arbitrary strings like names uh, or arbitrary texts like names, but we have, for example, categorical uh, texts. So you just have a limited set of things that could be true. For example, C++, Java, Python, all the programming languages, um, and or all the relevant programming languages, and then you just pick one of them. So that's the idea here, we have these categorical collections. And we can also get the levels by applying the levels function onto the programming languages. For example, this would give me just the unique values, C++, Java, and Python. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.